Hi everyone, this is a short introductory lecture on procedural sedation and analgesia within the emergency department. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand what is procedural sedation and analgesia, know some common indications for PSA, understand the pharmacology of different agents used for PSA, know how to assess a patient's suitability for PSA, and know Sinkang A&E's workflow for PSA and the use of Penthrox. This is the definition by the American College of Emergency Physicians for procedural sedation and analgesia. The most important thing to note about this is that it involves the administering of sedatives or dissociative agents with or without analgesics in order to induce an altered state of consciousness that allows the patient to tolerate a painful or unpleasant procedure while preserving cardiorespiratory function. It is important to know the different levels of sedation that a patient may be subjected to. The levels of sedation are described under four main domains, namely responsiveness, airway, spontaneous ventilation, and cardiovascular function. On the far right is general anesthesia, which is beyond the scope of this lecture. This lecture focuses mainly on the first two columns, namely minimal and moderate sedation. In the ED, our aim is to ensure the patient is comfortable and pain-free during painful procedures. As such, moderate sedation is what we aim for, where there is purposeful response to verbal or tactile stimulation, while airway, ventilation, and cardiovascular function are not affected. In some instances, even deep sedation may be required where the ED team will need to support the patient's airway and ventilation while performing the procedure. Some indications for PSA are reduction of joint dislocations, cardioversion, pediatric cases, imaging, for example, CT scan in an agitated patient, or any painful condition needing intervention in the A&E. The assessment of a patient prior to administration of PSA is of utmost importance. The fundamentals of history taking and physical exam are not to be forgotten. A detailed past medical history must be taken, specifically asking about respiratory diseases such as asthma and COPD, as well as cardiovascular diseases such as ischemic heart disease or valvular heart disease. The ASA status should be determined. A thorough airway assessment must be performed, identifying potentially difficult airways. History must include the time of the last meal and drink. And lastly, the patient's capacity to provide informed consent must be determined. And all this should be clearly documented in the notes before PSA is performed. The American Society of Anesthesiologists uses a well-known system to classify patients into different categories when undergoing general anesthesia. The same may be used to try to ascertain if a patient is at risk during procedural sedation. In general, PSA is not given to patients in the ED if they belong to ASA class 3 or more. More often than not, ASA class 1 and class 2 patients are suitable for PSA within the A&E. Common drugs used for PSA are propofol, ketamine, etomidate, midazolam, fentanyl, and methoxyflurane, which in itself is not, an, is not a sedative but has analgesic properties. Propofol is a milky liquid that is easily available in the emergency department. Propofol works by increasing GABA-mediated inhibitory tone in the CNS. It does have sedative properties, but has no analgesic properties. Its onset of action is within 60 seconds, and duration is from 10 to 30 minutes, depending on the dose. Usually, we give it an aliquot of 10 to 20 milligrams, and we repeat it every 3 to 10 minutes to the desired effect. 
Adverse reactions include anaphylaxis for those who are allergic to egg or soy, so it's important to elicit this history prior to administering propofol. Hypotension, respiratory depression, and bradycardia. Time to full orientation may be anywhere between 10 to 20 minutes, and propofol comes in an ampule which contains 200 milligrams in 20 mils, which equates to 10 milligrams per mil when pulled up into a syringe. Next up is ketamine, a favorite among emergency physicians. It is characterized by the so-called dissociative anesthetic state with profound analgesic, moderate hypnotic, and marked sympathomimetic reactions. It is commonly used in the pediatric procedures in Sinkang a &E. The onset of action is between 60 seconds to a minute when given IV and three to four minutes when given intramuscularly. Duration can last between 10 to 15 minutes when given intravenously and up to an hour when given intramuscularly. The dose varies between 1 to 1.5 kmg per kg intravenously, but a higher dose is required when given intramuscularly, 3 to 4 milligrams. Acute adverse reactions include emergence phenomena, salivation, bronchospasm, and autonomic symptoms, as well as vomiting. Time for orientation depends on the route given. It comes in an ampule containing 100 milligrams in 2 mils, which equates to 50 milligrams per mil when drawn up into a syringe. Ketamine is frequently given as an intramuscular injection for sedating pediatric cases in the emergency department. Etomidate is a short-acting sedative that has been used since the early 1970s for anesthesia and works by binding to GABA receptors, potentiating the effects of GABA. It lacks any analgesic properties. Its onset of action is 20 to 60 seconds. Duration of action is about 10 minutes. And the dose is equivalent to about 2 to 4 milligrams that is given in aliquots to the desired effect. Acute adverse reactions include hypotension, myoclonus, and possibly vomiting. Time to full orientation is up to half an hour. It comes in an ampule containing 20 milligrams in 10 mils, which equates to 2 milligrams per mil when drawn up into a syringe. Midazolam is a short-acting benzodiazepine. Almost all of its pharmacologic effects, including sedation, anxiolysis, enterograde amnesia, and anticonvulsant effects, can be explained through its action on GABA receptors. However, it lacks any analgesic properties. Its onset of action are between 3 to 5 minutes when given intravenously and longer when given intramuscularly. Duration can be up to 30 to 40 minutes, and the dose intravenously is usually given in aliquots of 1 to 2 milligrams every 3 to 5 minutes. The acute adverse reactions are predictable, such as sedation, hypotension, and respiratory depression. It is advisable to reduce doses in those who are elderly or who have acute renal injury or chronic renal injury. It comes in an ampule containing 5 milligrams in 5 mils which is equivalent to one milligram per mil when drawn up into a syringe. Fentanyl is a strong synthetic opioid, which is similar to morphine, but produces analgesia to a greater extent. At high doses, it may cause sedation. Its onset of action is one to three minutes and may peak at 20 to 30 minutes. The duration of action is up to, up to one hour when given in a single dose of 100 micrograms. The dose is usually 25 to 50 micrograms, titrated to effect. Acute adverse reactions include muscle rigidity at high doses or bradycardia. It comes in an ampule of 100 micrograms in 2 mils, which comes up to 50 micrograms per mil when drawn up into a syringe. Methoxyflurane is an inhaled anesthetic gas that fell out of favor in the 1960s due to its potential for nephrotoxicity. However, it has been found in very low doses to be an excellent analgesic. In Sengkang ED, misoxyfluorine is readily available and used for pain control in patients with musculoskeletal injuries and for manipulation and reduction of certain joint dislocations. Its onset of action is about one to three minutes and its duration depends on the usage. The dose is three mils via the inhaler 
and acute adverse reactions include dizziness. Contraindications include hepatic impairment, renal impairment, and pregnancy. Within Sengkang a &E, PSA is performed regularly. All patients needing any PSA are to be discussed with a senior on shift, preferably the one covering the same zone that the patient is triaged to, and usually it is either the, no either the north zone, south zone, or the resuscitation bay. Patient's vital signs must be monitored every five minutes. The stuff includes blood pressure monitoring, continuous cardiac monitoring, and oxygen saturations. It is especially important to also place the patient on end-tidal carbon dioxide monitoring. One must ensure that the patient has a working IV access and access to a crash cart, which should contain emergency airway equipment and emergency drugs. The staff include a resuscitation trained nurse, one doctor to perform the procedural sedation, and one doctor to perform the procedure. In St. Kang a &E, the senior doctor must be present for every case of procedural sedation. After all the stuff, staff, and the space is ready, PSA can be initiated. A single agent or a combination of agents may be used depending on the procedure and the physician's preference. Of note, more than use of one agent means that lower doses of each agent should be used and the doses should be titrated to effect. Common combinations include fentanyl and midazolam, propofol and fentanyl, propofol and ketamine, also known as ketofol, or etomidate and fentanyl. Each of these agents may be used alone as well. Post-procedural sedation and analgesia, the patient must be monitored till awake and able to tolerate orally, since some of the common side effects are vomiting. The discharge must be to a responsible adult who will be able to monitor the patient for the next 24 hours. Patient must be advised by providing a sedation advice form, which is available in the department. A family member who is being discharged to should be updated. It must be mentioned clearly that the patient is not allowed to drive, swim, or operate heavy machinery in the next 24 to 48 hours. In summary, PSA is a valuable skill that is unique to the realm of emergency medicine. The pharmacology of commonly used drugs should be revised frequently and committed to memory. A thorough assessment is vital to successful PSA and it should include a good past medical history, a thorough physical exam including an airway assessment, and obtaining informed consent. Stuff, staff and space should be prepared and checklists can be used to help with this where possible. Drugs may be used alone or in combination and should be given in titrated doses. Post-PSA monitoring and advice is crucial and patients should only be discharged home with a responsible adult to care for them. We have come to the end of this lecture. Should there be any questions, please feel free to ask any of the seniors on the ground. Thank you.